Hi everyone. Today we are trying to answer a five thousand dollar question. Can we perform a pre-compliance far field radiated emission test in our workspace? Well, to answer that question, first let us ask why do we need to send our unit to the chamber for far field radiated emission tests? Well, there must be a good reason for that. In fact, it is almost impossible. To perform radiation emission tests in a typical normal work environment, compared to test the unit in the chamber, there are mainly two reasons. First, as I explained before, in the conducting emission test, there are so many equipment in this work environment. Some of them are in standby mode, some of them are working, and they inevitably produce radiated fields. So as a result, this ambient noise has a much higher noise floor compared to Uh, chamber, and the second reason is as you can see here. This is my working environment. I have many metal or quasi metal structures nearby, and the problem with metal structure is that they can bounce or reflect radiated energy, and sometimes this reflection can cause inaccuracy up to twenty dB. So really, if you cannot control all these factors, there's really no point to perform a far field emission measurement in your workspace. But then you might be asking, why are we talking about this? Well, if you are design engineers, you will probably have more than three or five iterations before the final design is confirmed. So for each iteration, you might want to check the conducted emission and also the radiated emissions. And sending this design to a chamber costs money and time and、uh, your human resource. So it is a good idea if you can set up a pre-compliance far field measurement in your lab that will make troubleshooting and iteration much more efficient. So that's the reason we need to discuss this topic. So today we're going to discuss a hybrid method in which we will use a combined Temp cell and far field antenna to introduce you a method that you can use to get as close as possible to a radiated emission test in the lab. So, follow us through. To perform a pre-compliance radiated emission test, as we mentioned, we're going to use a hybrid method. The first step I often do is to test the DUT. In the tent, inside the tent, using a tent cell. So, as you can see here, inside the tent, we have a tent cell, and we, what we are going to do is we're going to put the DUT inside the tent cell, and then close the tent and perform a, a scan. The benefits of doing this is to give you a benchmark because we know what is inside the tent cell is really quiet. So, whatever spectrum or spurious results you get from the Um, results, you know, it is the true EMI coming from the DUT. You might ask, can we relate that results to the far field measurement? And the answer actually is no. You might read some articles talking about、uh, correlation methods、um, to basically、um, using the tensor results to predict the far field. But the truth is, it is often impossible to do that. However, the benefit, as I mentioned before, is to know the true EMI、um, performance of your unit, even though it is a near field measurement. But the information is important, as you will see later. To demonstrate、uh, today's session, we are actually going to we are going to use two units, right? As you can see, the first demonstration unit is this one. It is a, dev- a development board with screens and、um, program board. And together with、uh, some ribbon cable connection, this will definitely show some high frequency spectrums,、uh, narrow band signals caused by the screen, caused by the communication line, and also the whole unit is powered by a small power supply unit. It is a good quality power supply unit, actually got from Raspberry Pi. So we know this this、um, this should pass、um, the radiated emission easily from the power point of view. However, anything here is high-speed signal lines, so that's why we're using this for our demonstration. And the second unit we're going to use is、um, this one. So this this will be our second、uh, unit for demonstration. We choose this one simply because、um, 
it is a uh, uh, mains comes in and DC out. This is an active clamp uh, flyback converter. Okay, and the reason we use this for demonstration is if I flip over, you will see uh, this board actually uses um, GAN device. Okay, GAN transistors for the power conversion. So we're going to, need to test the the EMI performance of GAN devices, which is, you know, some people are really interested to see. And, and this unit really is just a power conversion board. So you won't be able to see radiation in, in terms of uh, higher frequency, narrow band noise, but we are expecting to see radiation caused by, you know, the cable radiator and perhaps also the PCB radiates as well. As you can see, and um, this needs to be connected to a load, and the load we're using is a, a self-powered active load. The purpose of having this kind of load rather than your normal electronics load is that this one actually doesn't emit any EMI uh, by itself. So really good for um, testing the true um, EMI performance of your PCB. Okay, and we can see the test setup. Uh, in the tent, uh, the tent cell itself is sits inside the tent, and we are connecting the um, uh, signal to our uh, spectrum analyzer. In this case, as you can see, we will be using a real time spectrum and spectrum analyzer. The benefits of using real time spectrum analyzer, as you will soon soon see, is that it's fast sweeping uh, speed, and we're going to control the spectrum analyzer using. TechBox EMC View software. Now, depending on your DUT size, you should, if you can, you should always try three um, orientations of a DUT. For, for example, currently we're just laying the PCB, the whole unit flat. But of course, it's because our test DUT is it's quite large. Um, if, if your DUT is small, you should always rotate by 90 degrees and then uh, do another uh, 90 degrees. To do that, then you, you should be able to cover every um, aspect of the radiating profile of a DUT. But for this demonstration, we just wanted to check uh, uh, the worst case scenario. I think in this case, the worst case scenario is this, this um, orientation. So we are happy with this. Test setup ready. Now we just need to perform a scan. Uh, again, we're using EMC View software to perform the scan for us. First, again, to connect the spectral analyzer. In this case, we will, we're connecting a real-time spectral analyzer. So in order to do that, uh, you need to enable the function. The function is in Setup, Options. And as you can see here, we have a real-time mode. So if you click real-time mode, you can find currently the software supports RIGO and Sigland uh, real-time spectral analyzers because we're using Sigland SSA real-time spectral analyzer. Therefore, we select Sigland. Okay, so that's already selected. Good. Now, is next is to load the project file. Now, there are some test methods actually define the TEM cell limits. For example, if you go to CISPR25, you will find a folder called TEM cell folder, and then you can load the TEM cell limit as you wish. But in this case, because we want to test the far field radiating emission, and it's, it is a home appliance product, therefore we can just select CISPR22, doesn't matter, we can select radiating emission limit. And let's say for the demonstration purposes, we're going to use CISPR22 class A, 30 meg to 1 gigahertz, 3 meter. Okay, so we load the project file. And as you can see, the test limit is loaded. That's the 3 meter far field test limit line. That's fine. Frequency range between 30 megahertz all the way up to 1 gig. And we wanted to really test that frequency range. So that's also good. And the next thing is to uh, do the scan. But before we do the scan, let's just quickly check the, the ambient scanning inside the tent. As I mentioned, it should be a flat line uh, with very low amplitude, indicating a very quiet EM environment in the temp cell inside the tent. Therefore, we need to do that. So in this case, we select set, set 2 to perform um, the ambient. Okay, so all I need to do is just to select the same setup uh, segment file, which is uh, CISPR22, 
and uh, 30 meg to 1 gig and uh, that should be it okay right so just cross check yeah these two are exactly the same okay so now let's perform a uh, ambient scan first so when I click the spectrum analyzer started scanning as you can see because it is a real-time spectrum analyzer the scanning speed is extremely fast just as we spoke it's already here already so it doesn't take longer than one minute to complete the scan all from 30 megahertz all the way up to 1 gigahertz that's why we pre always prefer to use a real-time uh, spectrum analyzer these days because it just saves lots of time So next is we're going to select set one and we're going to power the unit up and we're going to perform a scan again but with the unit power on okay all right so there is the result is here with the unit on and we can see definitely lots of narrowband noise showing here. Um, the limit line actually doesn't mean anything here because it's a far field limit line. Um, but what we're interested in really is to record all these narrowband signals and then when we perform the far field measurements using antenna later on, we can then check each individual point to make sure that all the uh, spurious measured here is not going to exceed the limit. Okay, so that's important. Let's save the uh, results first. Save chart chart only. We can call it uh, EUT1 Tencel. results okay so we can then move to EUT2 for DUT2 we will test actually uh, on this side and possibly on the other side and maybe even test on this side as well just to find out the worst case scenario okay but we'll start with this side first okay so we start DUT2 scanning some uh, big resonance peaks picking up and you can even hear the uh, spectral analyzer overloading messages here okay so we'll see okay so for DUT2 as we had explained earlier since it is a uh, power electronics devices most of the energy whether it is radiated or conducting emission come from the switching of the converter and often uh, for power converters we don't see narrow band uh, spectrums above 300 megahertz uh, which is what's showing in this case because as you can see the main radiated emission danger zone let's call it is really from 30 meg uh, 50 meg to 200 megahertz range as we can see there are two resonance peak picked up by here but even the, the these two points which possibly touching the limit uh, are wide band signals not narrow band signals so a very typical trace of a power converter okay so again as I mentioned before we just need to perform a few more scans and to find the worst case uh, scenario um, and then we will save the results and then we move on to uh, far field antenna measurement after this okay okay now we move to um, the far field pre-compliance test as we mentioned before uh, in order to avoid ambient noise and reflections the best location for far field measurement well, except the chamber is to find uh, open space the best is like a roof or basement in your workspace or simply like a field, open field. And what we see in the field, that's what we meant. As you can see, that's what we talk about when we talk about open space. Wide area with no metal structures. So I would take my 
uh, antenna and portable spectral analyzer and set it up your unit three or ten meters away and powered by a UPS and then perform a test. Well, you get this. As you can see, I'm standing next to my full-size biconical antenna. Often this type of antenna has a frequency range between 30 megahertz all the way to 350 or 400 megahertz. And in this frequency range, most of the time we will see emissions caused by uh, a unit, but then the radiated uh, field is radiated by cable structure. So often we use biconical antenna to pick up the radiated emission between 30 megahertz to 400, 300 megahertz. And from 300 megahertz up all the way up to gigahertz range, region, we need different types of antennas. So for example, here, as you can see on the shelf, we have a home type antenna, which is capable from one gigahertz to all the way to six gigahertz. The log periodic often from 400 megahertz to 1.2 gigahertz. And we also got some uh, rod antenna and small biconic antenna there. Okay, here we are. We have the test set up in the back garden simply because here is relatively quiet electromagnetic wise and less um, metallic uh, ob objects here. And as you can see, we have a ground plane, we have the LISM connected to the ground plane, and the LISM is connected to isolation transformer. And our DUT sits on a 80 centimeters tall uh, insulation support, ideally wood, uh, but in this case, plastics. Um, we have the mains cable dangling around, cable length, um, you can check the standards, but in this case, it's about one meter long. Uh, and uh, we power the DUT using the mains. And if I measure from this point where my DUT sits, and I measure three meters uh, long, and here is my antenna. So this point here to DUT is about three meters long. And as you can see, currently, the antenna is set as horizontal polarization, but I can also change into vertical, and I can also change the height. So normally I would perform three or four scans to see wh which case is the worst case scenario. And in this case, we're only uh, doing the measurements using the full-size biconic antenna simply because as we checked the EM performance of the DUT in a TEM cell, the, the uh, red flag area where, you know, the, in the frequency range where this DUT radiates the most is often between 30 megahertz to about 300 megahertz. And because it is a power converter, so the main radiated um, mechanism is actually through the uh, mains cable. So in that case, a full-size biconic antenna often work between 30 megahertz all the way up to about 300 and 400 megahertz is the ideal choice for measuring radiating emission. So in this case, we're going to perform a three meter long distance scan, but first we're going to do a um, ambient scan first, and then we're going to uh, power the units up and then do the uh, scan why the unit is powered up and we're going to compare the performance. Okay, I want to take a few minutes to explain uh, some of the important uh, things when you perform a radiated emission test using an antenna. And often these are the questions people ask a lot. Now, if you look at the equation showing on top of this slide, you will see that the electric field you measure using the antenna uh, equals the spectral analyzer reading and with all these other factors here. And you will notice that in this diagram, I have an uh, antenna connect to a small attenuator and then low noise amplifier and then to the spectral analyzer. But I would like to make it clear that for pre-compliance radiated emission tests in your workspace, you don't need the attenuator and low noise amplifier. People say you need attenuator for better matching, but in my experience, it doesn't really matter. And the reason, the reason that people argue uh, about using a low noise to the uh, small size, especially small size uh, antenna, is they say that you can effectively lower the noise floor. But this is only true if you use it in a in a chamber where the, the ambient noise 
floor is very low, then you can use this method. In your real work environment, when you use a low noise amplifier, you amplify everything, including the noise floor, the local uh, radio transmitters, and and you, the DUT signal. So effectively, it's not really lowering your noise floor. So in that's that is why I would say let's keep things simple and keep things straight, right? So in this case, if we forget about the attenuator, the low noise amplifier, we make things much simpler. So if you look at this, all you need to do is to connect your spectral analyzer to your um, antenna. Now, quick explanation of the antenna factor. Antenna factor, as you can see, is defined as a factor against your frequency. As your, um, in this case, you can see there's a V-shape antenna factor. But the general rule is you wanted the antenna factor as low as possible. But because of the physical build, each antenna has a different. Uh, each antenna has its own antenna factor. For small size antenna factor, inevitably in a lower frequency range, you will have higher antenna factor compared to a full size uh, antenna. And uh, you, when you perform the radiative emission test, simply add the antenna factor in your reading. Okay. Okay. So. As we explained, the antenna is connected to a spectral analyzer, where the spectral analyzer actually sits, in this case, in my office. So it's ha have a fair uh, long distance between the two. Uh, and I'm holding a, a data sheet. As we explained, all antennas, when you buy an antenna, um, the manufacturer will often supply you with an antenna factor. So in this case, I have the data sheets in my hand. And actually, the data sheet provides the antenna factor for one meter, two meters and three meters. So that's really handy because sometimes, as I uh, said previously, you would like to move the antenna a little bit closer, maybe because the ambient noise is very big. So in that case, say you want to place the antenna at one meter distance, you need the antenna factor uh, uh, at one meter. So in this case, we are going to use the software uh, to control the scan, the antenna factor, can be stored in the software, so I don't have to do anything. I can just click the scan, and the software will basically perform the scanning. And uh, we again, we're using uh, real-time spectral analyzer. Uh, so first, we are going to uh, do an ambient scan, as I said, and then we're going to power the unit up and do a, a, uh, a scan with the unit is on. Okay. Okay. Again, we're using EMCU software to help us perform the radiated emission test. The next thing is to uh, load the project file. Currently, by default, uh, we select CISPR22 class A, right? So that's the limit line, as you can see. If you want to have, say, class B rather than class A, simply go to class B, and you can see here that's class B. We know class B is a little bit more stringent than class A. So if I select that, you can see, yeah, the limit line drops. Um, for the test. As explained, the most important factor in this setup is the antenna factor, right? So antenna factor is here in antenna correction file. Go to here, you can see in this folder we have already got uh, some antenna factors. Techbox has his own antenna factors from TBMA1 all the way to TBMA6. So that covers from the full-size bike home, small bike home, log periodic home to uh, E-field and uh, uh, magnetic field antennas. In this case, we are using stress spec, uh, and in that uh, we're testing the unit three meters away. Therefore, I select three meters. So if you have your own antenna and you have your manufacturer supplied antenna factor, what do you need to do? Go to setup, select edit antenna and there we, there you are you have all these uh, uh, easy uh, options that you can place your uh, antenna factors in this table so you can type it manually or you can select one of these load and then just um, change the db form here so in this case as you can see i start uh, with 25 megahertz with my antenna and stopped in 310 megahertz for my full-size biconic antenna and I'm happy with that good so that's it really um, another thing is because we only need to perform uh, the tests from 30 to 300 megahertz for the reasons we explained um, 
and by default is uh, spanning all the way up to one gig so we don't want that we go to segment and we get rid of all and then we just perform one two three four five six all the way up to uh all the way up to 11 i believe yeah so that's 100 200 and 300 that's about 11. so that's 11 9 10 11 and same applies to set two um set two we want to perform the same scan as set one tap so we'll use set two as a uh, uh, ambient scan and we can use set one as the uh, unit on scan yeah. so both are the same you can see and for segment two i probably do the same only starts from one to uh, 11 okay so that gives me the frequency scanning to about 300 megahertz and that's it um, i can also uh, define my chart from 30 to 300 megahertz that's better so yeah everything's ready uh, all I need to do is to click this button and uh, perform the uh, scanning all right all the setup is ready I'm going to perform an ambient scan using set 2 uh, so if I click start as you can see my um, spectral analyzer real-time spectral analyzer quickly uh, started performing and as you can see um, the ambient noise shows, so this is my raw data, and this is with the antenna factor fractured in. So overall, I would say the ambient noise is not too bad. It has more, more than 6 dB, so roughly about 10 dB below the standard I was going to test against. So that is pretty, pretty good. Okay, so that's my uh, ambient scanning done. Now I'm going to select set one, and I'm going to power the unit up and then perform a, a, a scanning using set one. I'll power the unit up. Now let's perform another test using set one and see what happens. As you can see, green trace is our uh, scanning with the unit is on. And you can see if we want to test uh, CISPA 22 class B, then we might have some problems here, here, and here. As you can see, it all exceeds the limit. So let's wait until the scan is complete. And as I said, um, we're probably going to perform a horizontal test as well and different heights. Okay, let's have a look at the results. Um, we know these are raw data that coming uh, straight from the uh, spectral analyzer reading. And with the antenna factors, we have the ambient scan, which is shown in pink, and green, which is why the unit is powered on. Okay, so we can get rid of the raw data and just have a look at the um, unit noise. As we can see, really, we create some resonance peaks in sort of 35 megahertz, then 50 megahertz, and then 65 again. And here we have, uh, I don't know, 120 ish. We have a, a few resonance peak which potentially uh, could uh, cause issues now these uh, signals we know coming from the local radio transmitters so we know that because we can see it in ambient therefore i'm not worried about this results at all same applies to these uh, dab signals here and also you can see these are some ambient spurs which you know we're, we're not really worried okay uh, we mentioned this this is a hybrid method and we have previously performed stem cell results now it's time to load the stem cell results and have a look to do that first i can get rid of the ambient because that's not really uh, useful so we have the uh, our final result showing here now go to file utilities and i can load uh, my file so if i choose trace one and we know this is dut2 and I can just uh, select uh, front, I think. Yeah, we can do that. Then uh, we load the file. So this will be showing in my uh, reference one, trace one. So that's the chart. And now you can see trace one will load stem cell results front. Yeah. And we know uh, trace one has two set set one set two set two is the ambient in term cell we know that so we can uh, get rid of that and then uh, trace uh, uh, trace one set one in 
dark green is the uh, tensile result. Okay, so let's have a look. First, as I said, beyond 300 megahertz, that's really not uh, our concern. So our focus should be really between 30 megahertz and 300 megahertz. And second is the resonance uh, peak. As you can see, tensile result shows a resonance peak here and here. And we actually see another resonance uh, in the far field, very similar to this one. And especially this, 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 these three peaks are very similar to the tensile results. And even the amplitudes uh, are close enough. Okay, because as we mentioned, tensile cell is really a near field measurement. So here we know um, it's quite high, but in the far field, it's it's not that high, but it still could be uh, causing radiated emission issues. Okay, and similar profile uh, can be seen here as well. The tensile couldn't predict the cable radiation very efficiently, so therefore this bit which is the uh, far field measurement could be caused by cable radiation where tensile cannot see that okay so it tells us that we really need to to pay attention to these points because we trust more about far field measurement and um, these are really close to the limit line yeah for class a yeah if it's class a I probably wouldn't uh, worry too much. Uh, again, I would, I would trust more on the far field measurement, and as you can see, uh, we'll probably will be okay because you know there's more than 60 dB below the limit line. However, if we test it against class B, then we have some work to do to bring down the noise, just give us a little bit more confidence level. Uh, as we can see here, you can even put the margin. So uh, go to class B again. Let's try, let's try class B. Um, 30 megahertz, so that will drop the limit. And then if I put margin, say, um, 6 dB margin, so you can see that's the margin line, and uh, we're definitely above the margin line. So I would say there is a lot of work to do to bring down these noise uh, below the limit line. Here, um, above 200 megahertz, we're actually, actually fine. So again, the focus should be in this frequency range. Let's have a look at the uh, other uh, DUT, the uh, uh, screen and display uh, boards there, okay? So in this case, now as you can see, we're moving to uh, the uh, office. So compared to outside, it's slightly uh, worse in terms of the ambient. Uh, as also you can see, now we change the antenna. So in this case, we're using a TDM A1, very small biconic antenna capable from 30 megahertz all the way up to one gigahertz. The reason is because we know that board will emit noise from the tensor result pretty much from like 200 megahertz to 1 gigahertz and it's narrow band um, therefore you know as the frequency goes up when we talk about you know, over 200 megahertz or 100 megahertz then your antenna effectively can be moved a little bit closer because we know there is a relationship between the far field and near field and it often is in a lower frequency range, you need to be aware that you have to keep a good distance to measure the far field. As frequency increases, your distance can be reduced. As you can see here, the small antenna we're pointing to the DUT is actually two meters away, okay? And in fact, when we perform the measurement, we will move the antenna to one meter away. Then the difference is when we perform a three meter a distance test, we can use the three meter limit line, but when we perform a one meter distance test, we can just add 10 dB, um, and basically lifts up the limit, up, limit line by 10 dB. Okay, so now we have a look at the test setup. When you test something in the work environment, as always, we want to minimize ambient noise as much as we can. So as you can see here, we're still using the laptop to control the uh, spectral analyzer, but the laptop is um, is not powered by the power supply, but rather just keeps the battery to keep the noise uh, ambient noise down. You can also see that we have three ferrite, which have uh, multiple terms on the on the cable to suppress the noise coming from the um, uh, spectral analyzer. Spectral analyzer is connected to the 
antenna, and we also have uh, some ferrite on the on the uh, coaxial cable just to suppress the noise. And in terms of uh, here, we again we have wood wooden table, um, eighty centimeters above the ground plane, and we have um, a lizard. You might ask, um, why do we need a lizard for radiant emission tests? Well, in fact, the lizard here is to provide a defined impedance to the mains cable, because if you don't connect the unit to a lizard, then chances are you have no idea what is the mains impedance. It could be high impedance, could be low impedance. Regardless, it will affect the RF current flow on the cable. So that's why we always want to provide a lizard um, for the irradiated emission test. Okay, so let's have a look at the uh, performance of the DUT at one meter distance. As we set uh, setup wise, we need to test the performance up to one gigahertz now. So change uh, the charge frequency to one gig, and we're using set one. Um, we're not going to perform ambient test in this case. Uh, select all. Now we're going to perform all, and um, because we move the uh, antenna really one meter away from the DUT, even we are going to test class B, we need to lift the uh, limit line by about 10 dB. So to make things simple, I can simply choose class B to uh, class A limit, right? So I put class A limit and yeah, it gives me about uh, 10 dB. Uh, so as a reference, we record it at 10, 10 uh, dB up and um, because now we changed the antenna, so yeah, let's select TBMA, TBMA, a conical antenna, and that's selected. So let's have a look. Hey, we've got some good results coming here, right? Um, because we want to compare again uh, with the tensor results, right? So load reference trace one, that's EUT one tensor results. Let's load it for now and have a look. Uh -huh, great. Okay, so again, the dark green is the tensile results, and the uh, green line, the light green line, is the uh, small antenna performing performing a radiated emission uh, scanning. The benefits of having the uh, tensile results is really to help you to determine which noises are actually from the unit and which are actually from the ambient. For example, we know these come from the radio transmitters, definitely not coming from the DUT, simply because we can't see any um, emissions in the TEM cell. I mean, here we can see a, a spike, and but in the far field actually is quite okay. I have my eyes on this peak here because you can see in TEM cell we can capture it and in the far field we can we can also capture it here. So that's something I need to have a closer look. Same applies to this one and um, this one as well. Yeah, uh, let's have a look. Yeah, this one is here, but this one we know it is ambient, so no problem because we can't see anything in the TEM cell. So these are definitely uh, the noise source coming from the uh, the noise coming from the EUT, so that's pretty pretty good. Um, okay, so the results is all shown here. Let's have a look. Um, as I explained, the dark green is the tensor results, and the light green is the uh, sort of antenna measurement. So, if I quickly disable this one, we know that um, because tensor shows a uh, spike here, spikes here, here, here. So these four definitely we need to check. So let me just put back the antenna results. Okay, so we, we had this one, as you can see here. That's the 144 megahertz noise. And um, again, it's actually touching the limit line and definitely over the margin we defined. Now notice, if you haven't followed us, let's um, stress it again. This limit line is class A because class A is 10 dB uh, higher than uh, class B. Um, but we actually test this against class B. But because we move the antenna uh, to be only one meter away from the DUT, we need to add another 10 dB, uh, which you know you can always add to the limit line in the uh, software as well. If you go to setup, you can add to the limit line. Anyway, so we, we call this our 
limit line, and we call this margin line our preferred passing margin line. So definitely, we need to check if this, uh, you know, if this is a problem, because again, this is a peak scanning result, and we are comparing against a quasi peak limit QP line here. So what we'll do is we're gonna actually select a, a point, and we're gonna perform a quasi peak later on. But anyway, so if I were to test my product uh, to make sure that it can pass um, the radiation emission test in the chamber, I will need to bring this down regardless. I need to bring this down to, um, to be the level um, below the margin line to give me good confidence, okay? So that one we, we highlighted. And um, what else? We had these two lines and also these two. One is here, which is sort of 190, uh, 192, definitely need to check, and, um, and I think here, yes, here, if I zoom in, you can see some are actually ambient, but uh, here, for instance, it's definitely not ambient, but from the DUT, okay, um, and same applies to this one, this is definitely uh, the noise coming from DUT, because we see it in the far field, it's actually exceeding the limit line, and it, um, we can see it in Tencel as well, okay? So that's the beauty of the combined, the hybrid methods of combining Tencel and uh, far field because you can, you can dis determine which noise are ambient, which actually is from your DUT, okay? What else? Well, you can basically uh, repeat and check, you know, all these spikes, okay, to see whether the far field uh, could be a problem. For example, we can see here, here, but here, here, actually a close to the margin line in the far field measurement. Therefore, it's not really a, of my concern. Um, but let's check here whether, yeah, this is definitely uh, a concern. It's quite high. Um, and let's check the, uh, the frequency is 240. So if we go to 240, that's here. Let's check 240. Uh, really above the limit line by 6.3 dB. So uh, plus we define 6 dB margin, so that's more than 10 dB over the margin line. Therefore, we definitely need to check this. Okay, so let's just quickly check this point. Let's perform a quasi-peak scan to see if, if the quasi-peak result is below the limit or above the limit. Okay, simple right click, and you can see measure, consider drift, and click that. And uh, um, I believe that starts the uh, quasi peak scanning now. Um, so, what it does, it will basically takes time, as you can see, it's starting here, and then uh, it will do a, a few scans and then give you the quasi peak result. Let's just have a look. Okay, yeah, quasi peak often takes uh, a lot longer than normal scanning, but here we are, we have the quasi peak results, which is showing as a cross here. As you can see, the, even the quasi peak result is higher than the limit line we define, definitely a lot higher than the margin line. So I wouldn't be feeling confident to send this unit for um, chamber testing. Uh, so I have a lot of work to do to bring down the noise before I can send it um, to the chamber. So the, really, the step really is now to fix the issue and then basically repeat the same thing again, tem cell plus the far field until we're happy, okay? we explained um, before that if, again, we're using this um, AC-DC converter uh, as a demonstration, we explained before that um, if you look at the temp cell results and you compare with far few results, then you can see that um, in the sort of like 30 megahertz up to about 70, 80 megahertz, the temp cell cannot predict the um, radiation uh, effectively. That is because for this particular product, um, pay attention, I said for this particular product, which is a power conversion board, um, the main radiation route is through the cable, right, through the cable. So uh, that's why when you place this in the tensile, uh, you, the cable is not properly placed inside the tensile, therefore it's not that effective. And that, that is why sometimes people say, you can place a current, an RF current probe on the cable and use the common mode, common mode current information 
to predict far fields. Now, this method uh, actually has two limitations. One is, as we explained, it only applies for certain types of products. For example, if it is a power converter or motor drive board, this often works simply because it's broadband noise and uh, it's the cable radiation that, that dominates. Second is, this method has its own frequency and limitation. It often works from 30 megahertz all the way up to perhaps 300 megahertz or 400 megahertz. Some people argue it can work up to one gigahertz, but often, according to my experience, is that from 300 megahertz, it can give uh, over prediction. So that means you predict uh, fail, but actually it's not failing. Okay, so these are the two limitations. But regardless, this is a very powerful tool, especially if you don't have a full-size antenna or you don't have an antenna, but you still want to know the, you know, the EMC prediction, EMI prediction in terms of far fields, then you can use this method. This method was first introduced many, many years ago by a few um, EMC engineers and consultants. Uh, Doc Smith has talked about this method in the past, but the person who really tried to perfect this uh, method, make this method perfect, is uh, Mr. Andy E.D. based in Canada. He has an excellent article on this, giving all the equations, uh, which are uh, attached to the show notes. You can have a look. Uh, TechBox also, uh, the EMC View software, also embedded this uh, method. So it makes uh, the calculation a lot easier. So I, I'm a lazy person. I like to use um, software to uh, make things simpler. So today we're going to demonstrate this method uh, by using the current current probe. So as you can see here, we have an RF current probe. Uh, we have the DOT sits on the table, and it's very simple. Basically, I just uh, clip the current probe to the mains wire, and uh, and uh, the distance from the current probe to the DOT. Uh, there's no rule. But if you place on a different location of an RF uh, of, a, of a cable, then you will have different results. So it really depends. Um, often they suggest you, you should test a few locations and use the worst location uh, for your reference. But in this case, for demonstration purpose, we often just put it on a, on a location about 10 centimeters away from the, uh, from, from the DUT. And we're going to uh, power the unit up measure the common mode current on this mains cable and correlate this result to the far field using uh, the algorithm we just discussed and we will compare with uh, an antenna result but because um, uh, now we're in the office so the antenna is only two meters away so we're going to also perform a far field measurement using an antenna which sits at two meters away and we're going to compare the two meters away far field measurement results uh, against this um, prediction method and to see how close the results can be, okay? To use the methods we just introduced, uh, it's actually very simple to perform using the MCView software. All you need to do is, uh, I'll just quickly show you, if in the folder, again, on the source component uh, current probes, you can see here, under the current probe um, source file, I have a TBCP2750 MZ, that, that's my own current probe, uh, which I edit the transfer impedance um, of the current probe using the MCView software. And I have another one called I2E. So if I double click this one, you will see the only difference between this file and the other one is I have this option I2E. And you can see here, length equals one, distance equals two, which means I select length as one meter long cable and distance is two meter far fields. So I'm using this uh, equation uh, embedded in the EMC view software by telling the software to do a length of wire of one meter long, which is in my case, and I wanted to predict the far field in two meters away. Okay, so once I have this, then um, again, very simple. All you need to do is so, first thing is I basically disable the antenna factor because in this case we're not using antenna, and then I'm going to enable this. Um, newly edited special current probe file, okay, as you can see, 750 MZI2E saved here. And all I need to do basically is power the unit up and perform a scan. And let's have a look 
at how accurate this uh, method can be. It's also worth mentioning that this method also has its limited frequency range. Often, the most effective uh, frequency range is between 30 megs uh, all the way up to about 300, some people say 500 megahertz. But generally speaking, as your frequency goes up, this method can overpredict uh, the radiant emission performance. So that's something to bear in mind. In this case, we just want to do a sweep between 30 and 300 megahertz using this method. Okay, power up and uh, I'm going to scan. So let's have a look. Some beeping there, okay. So we have the raw data, we have the predicted radiated emission performance and by the current pro measurement, as you can see here, uh, we've got some uh, predicted far field uh, emission uh, exceeds the limit. And here uh, again, uh, it's like this. And let's have a look again, some more inform uh, information comes in. Okay, and uh, that's stopped. Good. All right, so we had um, uh, the results available, which is based on the far field prediction based on the RF current probe uh, measurement. This is the raw data uh, measured in dB microvolts uh, from the current probe reading. And then obviously the algorithm has to uh, calculate the uh, current, right? And you based on the current probe uh, transfer impedance, and then using the algorithm to predict the far field performance. So everything is done uh, within the software. It does look like very similar to the far field measurement we had using the Bicon antenna, but let's let's just have a comparison because. Uh, we can do that right using uh, saved files. So if I go to utilities and then load uh, reference trace, and I'm going to select trace one as test bicom two meter, which is the test we just did using the uh, biconic antenna. So that's loading the far field measurement um, we performed, and you will see it takes some time, and that's it. Okay, so. In order to see it clearly, let me disable the raw data in this case. And in order to see even more, uh, even better, I can change my um, uh, color, right? So I can go to setup and I can edit colors and I call uh, this one uh, uh, chart uh, set one, okay? And let's change into. I think it's probably this one changing to green. Sorry, changing to red. Okay, that's better. That's better. Okay, so as we can see here, the, the red uh, trace is the predicted far field measurements by the RF current probe, whereas the green trace is the far field measurement. Now, notice that the far field measurement will only perform vertical polarization at a fixed distance of 2 meter and uh, the, the antenna height is also fixed. In reality, as I said, you need to perform uh, different heights with the um, uh, UT also rotate. But as a quick uh, scan, I would say these two uh, results are pretty much similar, especially in the frequency range where is a big concern, which is from 90 megahertz all the way to about 150, 160 megahertz. Uh, we we definitely have very similar uh, EMI profile, right? Like this, with a few resonance um, peaks here, and same applies to here. So the message really in this case is that if you don't have um, any means of far field measurement, it could be um, that you don't have an antenna, or it could be the ambient measurement in your environment is just way too high um, that you can't use any far field uh, measurement for pre-compliance testing, then try to use a current probe on the mains or power cable is a useful tool. But then again, as we explained, the, there are limitations. First is the uh, applicable frequency range. And second is depends on your product complexity. In this case, it's a power converter using power electronics devices. So for that 
particular products, this method is very useful. However, if you de develop something like high-speed digital uh, uh, circuits using lots of FPGA, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth modules, then this method is less useful because once the frequency is pushing up to 500 meg to 1 gigahertz range, we need to use something else because in that frequency range, a trace on the PCB basically can act as an antenna. So in that case, you only measure the uh, radio frequency signals on the mains cable. It doesn't tell you what the PCB radiation is. So in that case, you often need to have some more, um, some better tools such as a TEM cell, which we do have some demonstrations in our in other YouTube videos. Okay.